Hi folks, online and in the room. Um, I know many of you, my name's Beck, I'm in the Crawford School. And we're here for our Read Research Notes seminar today with Dr. Derek Edwards. So thanks very much to Kat, who's online for really leading the organization. Um, before we start, I'll acknowledge that we're here on the unceded lands of the Ngunnawal people and give my respect to elders past and present, and also um, acknowledge any First Nations people who are with us today. So Dr. Gareth Edwards is from uh, the School of International Development at the University of East Edinburgh, also a visiting fellow at the University of Sydney, which is why we have the good fortune of Gareth being here in person. So this wasn't a UK um, trip today, which is a good presentation today, although I'm sure you would have gone to have a good presentation tomorrow in the UK. Yeah. Um, Gareth is going to be talking to us about a topic that's very close to my heart and my interests, which is how we can manage the transition away from coal in a just way. So Gareth will be talking about um, some fellowship research that was overlaid with another grant, so the um, good problem to have of too many grants being successful all at once. <laughs> um, and I think we'll have, we've got an hour for the session and Gareth is going to talk for a little while and then we'll do some Q&A. So I'll help facilitate the Q&A. And if we've got questions from in the room, um, as Kat kindly pointed out, we'll go to the effort of restating questions to Gareth's response. Uh, and I'll just note as well that the session's being recorded, so it will go on the Crawford School YouTube channel later on, but I think we're going to stop that before the Q&A begins. So I'll now um, hand you over to Gareth, who's going to talk to us about just transition from coal. Thanks, Beck, and thanks for uh, having me here today. Um, and uh, the first thing to acknowledge, of course, is that as you can see from this title slide, this um, project was the work. I'll, I'll, I'll do that. Okay, sure. Uh, the work of uh, eight people. It was a very short project, five month project. Um, but I'd like to acknowledge uh, my colleagues Claire, Susan, Robert, Melena, Yarn, Dan, and Gemma, all of whom contributed to it. And as um, Beck said, actually, this project was something of a diversion from uh, the reason that I was back in Australia. Um, which was for a Labour Human International Fellowship examining actually pro-coal justice discourses uh, in Australia and India. The premise of the fellowship project is that any durable climate policy must engage just as carefully with uh, the normative arguments of those being made in favour of continued fossil fuel extraction as it does with those making arguments against it. Uh, but most of the academic literature on climate justice the area I've been most closely working in in recent years, uh, frames it either as a philosophical ideal or a policy objective or something that's being campaigned for by anti-fossil fuel movements. So my fellowship seeks to more carefully explore what I'm calling discursive politics of climate justice. And the idea of just transition comes in almost at the end of that project. But then I was awarded this grant near the beginning of the project, which it explicitly engages with just transition. So I've had to sort of do some flipping uh, to try and uh, make sense of the concept. The other thing to observe is this uh, British Academy funded project was very short. It was five months from commencement uh, to wrap up and that the just transition frame actually came from the funder who asked for projects looking at just transitions to decarbonisation in the Asia Pacific region. And usually for a British funder, Australia was one of the focus countries. So that means today's presentation is empirical in focus, um, but I am going to spend a bit of time with that talk to try and thread back the theoretical and academic strand, strands of the literature into what were essentially policy related findings of the project. So to start, let's consider uh, the idea of a just transition. The concept, of course, emerged in the 1970s in North America when the labor movement was grappling with how to move away uh, from polluting industries in a way that didn't uh, disproportionately or adversely affect their members. 
So like uh, the related concept of environmental justice, which also uh, arose from social movements, just transition is always part of discursive strategy and part of demand on policymakers. So it's always a political concept. And on the 5th of December, 1996, Brian Kohler from the Energy and Paperworkers Union of Canada gave a speech calling for just transition to the Persistent Organic Pollutants Conference in Chicago. Kohler argued, and I quote, if society must make some tough choices about which economic activities we are willing to continue and which we are willing to forego, a structured transition or quote, just transition program is necessary if the costs of these decisions are to be shared fairly. Capital can write off losses, he went on, collect insurance in some cases and reinvest elsewhere. Workers don't have these kinds of options. Without a just transition program, you guarantee conflict and possibly violent conflict. So Kohler went on to identify four characteristics that he thought should characterize any just transition program. The first was about wage protection for workers. The second about transition policies in terms of employment. The third was a bit more ambitious, redefining what employment means to be in line with sustainability principles. And the fourth and perhaps most forgotten was about supporting transition affected communities. That is not just the workers themselves. The following year, the Oil, Chemical and Atomic Workers Union of the US became the first union to formally adopt a resolution calling for a just transition. And the idea rumbled on through the labor movement for the next 10 years until it reached the uh, international sphere in 2008 with the publication of this report uh, jointly by the International Trade Unions Congress, International Labor Organization and the UNEP to report green jobs towards decent work in a sustainable low carbon world. The report focused on employment, but it introduced to the just transition concept, the notion that climate change is a relevant context for considering just transitions. And that that means that the idea of just transition has application, not just at local scales, but also at an international scale, for instance, between countries. But it also ensured that the primary focus of just transition remained on employment. Though I should note that by 2015, the International Labour Organization itself was beginning to expand the remit of just transition. In a report it wrote then, it said that just transition sh should include, quote, decent work for all, social inclusion, and the eradication of poverty. So there's a broader social goal other than just effective workers. So it's worth noting that Climate change wasn't the originating context for the context of just transitions. But since then, and with growing consciousness of climate change, it's definitely formed the core focus of academic research on just transition. So in this context, the British Academy released a funding call late last year, which I explained in the introduction, for policy focused projects, which were meant to speak directly to policymakers. And we framed our project around the aspirations of the call as a way to try and understand what just transitions mean in the Australian context, to draw out the challenges and opportunities to Australia in achieving a just transition away from coal and to place Australia's just transition in its regional context. And the findings that we generated more focus on the first two of these objectives than the later. So for the rest of the presentation, what I'm going to do is walk through four key policy relevant findings that I've been talking about in various contexts since the project wrapped up, but threading back the academic context into them to try and reflect on what academia and scholarship can offer to thinking about this idea. The first thing we discovered, of course, is that just transition is an extremely problematic term in Australia. On the surface, this is because there's a small number of very loud voices who have personal or political reasons for arguing against any transition, just or otherwise. 
and they've successfully poisoned the term just transition, associating it with the failures of structural adjustment, provoking fear of an unknown future, and linking the idea with the notion of inner city environmentalists moralizing against regional workers in the fossil fuel industry. So as one interviewee put it, uh, from an industry perspective, fear is a great way of motivating people. But if you're genuinely frightened, you tend to sort of cling on to what you know. This is the classic environment versus jobs trope. And it's been repeatedly cultivated in Australia through the climate wars. I'm sure that's no uh, uh, news to anyone in this room. And as a result, my interviewees continually reflected on the difficulty of using the term just transition in Australia. Remember, we'd come asking them about just transition framed by this funding call. One said, it's really important to note that particularly the unions really hate the transition word, just transition in particular. We just don't use it on the ground in this particular location anymore. Another said, we don't use the term just transition. We don't use the word. The only time it comes out of my mouth is when I'm talking to investors. And still another said, it's not just just transition. We don't even talk about the word transition. I sort of use change as shorthand now. Now, thinking about the literature on this, Australian scholars have certainly reflected on these challenges and given explanations for them. So Goddard and Farrelly in 2018 noted the potential of Queensland's, quote, powerful incumbent resources sector in utilising an environment versus jobs narrative. But they found that the application of just transition principles in Queensland has, quote, engaged communities and unions that were previously sceptical of renewable energy. Uh, Beck Colvin here and others, including John Wiseman, have observed the integration of just transition into the environment movement's discourses in Australia and the ways in which these have sometimes been met with suspicion, both about the motives of the actors, but also the fear that the environment is going to be prioritized ahead of people, particularly people in regional communities. This is particularly the case when such messages are delivered by advocates from afar, as Darren Snell and Sally Weller note where local narratives and identities clash with and resist the imposition of policy or transition discourses from what's perceived to be outside the community. So overall, we can observe that the Australian situation is certainly unique, but whilst the terminology seems particularly problematic here, just transition has never fully succeeded internationally in overcoming this jobs versus environment dilemma that it was devised as a counterpoint. So perhaps some caution is uh, required about the prospects for its more recent guises. More recent framings of the similar concepts include calls for a global, uh, sorry, for a green new deal, or more radical calls for a global green new deal. The second thing that became very clear when talking to our interviewees and analyzing uh, media coverage about this transition in Australia is that there's really two coal industries in Australia. It seems like a very obvious point, but there's a domestic coal-fired electricity sector and there's a coal mining industry. And the coal mining industry is overwhelmingly export oriented. And just transition is received very differently in both of these industries. So on the domestic front, coal is still the source of 55% of Australia's electricity and 28% of Australia's total energy use. But the domestic power generation is already transitioning away from coal with an unstoppable momentum. Perhaps this is why in recent days, uh, fossil fuel operators have refused to put their generation capacity into the market and instead preferred to wait for the Australian energy market operator to force them to and pay uh, the compensation. The last new coal-fired power station to open in Australia was in Western Australia 12 years ago, and 12 of the 34 power stations in Australia's fleet had closed by the end of 2017. So ONG's abrupt 2017 closure of the big Hazelwood power station in Victoria was a surprise to many, 
But when Origin Energy announced in February this year that it would close Eraring on the shores of Lake Macquarie in the shortest possible period that it's allowed to under the market rules, people weren't really surprised. As one industry representative put it in an interview, coal-fired power stations don't provide the flexibility that the grid requires, and so they're being priced out, essentially. Perhaps the complete breakdown of Australia's energy market in recent days bears out this perspective. Almost all of the academic and policy literature, as well as the vast majority of media coverage in Australia, focuses on the transition of this domestic electricity sector. There's a reason for that, perhaps because it's easier to address but it obscures a much bigger transition challenge. And that is that 87% of Australia's black coal is exported. All of the exports come from New South Wales and Queensland. And these exports contribute to over 3% of global carbon dioxide emissions. Though in popular and public discourse, Australia's high quality coal used in steel plants overseas is the focus. And most of Australia's more valuable coal does end up in steel production. The majority of this coal in terms of absolute volume ends up being burnt in thermal power stations in Asia. The one region of the world where the IEA, the International Energy, expects coal use to keep growing in the foreseeable future. So perhaps not surprisingly, the inevitability and the speed of transition are much more contested in this sector, particularly with coal prices at record highs due to economies first rebounding from COVID shutdowns and subsequently to Russia's invasion of Ukraine. As a few of our interviewees observed, We've got some quality and price and location that is in Australian coal. Competitive advantages, you know. Yes, the Indians and Chinese, maybe the Southeast Asian folks will pick up the slack. Maybe they won't in some cases. But I can see how an argument can be made that things will be stable for a long time in this export coal sector. A union representative said it's pretty hard to tell someone their industry is going to die when the companies are making loads of money and working out how they can get more coal out the ground. And a, 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 a public servant at the federal level said the position of the Australian government, this was an interview obviously before the election, but I'd say it's probably consistent, is that we have a high quality resource that will produce for as long as someone wants to buy it. And as yet, interestingly, there's hardly any academic literature focused on what a just transition might mean for Australia's export coal sector. The domestic coal-fired power generation sector attracts all the oxygen. Both of these industries have one thing in common, and that is that politics are the major barrier to a just transition. There's been a notable absence of government leadership in Australia both discursive leadership and material. The previous government was famously unwilling to even use the word transition. As a federal civil servant said, the government's not willing to talk about transitions. And there was a long pause. How are you supposed to plan for the future if you don't acknowledge pressures that the future's facing? Or as a community representative put it, we need all sides of government to actually acknowledge that things are changing. Scholars such as Dodd, Spencer, Wiseman and their colleagues have noted that government leadership, planning and facilitation are vital for any energy transition because they are inevitably complex and systemic in their effects. And as Wiseman says, this should include, quote, proactive, well-integrated industry policy and funded, well-coordinated public investment in economic and community strategies. But in Australia, as with other states, to be fair, there is a lack of capacity or perhaps willingness to undertake this task in an era characterized by neoliberal market-led governance approaches. And this observation has been made both in Australia and abroad. Of course, both major political parties in Australia 
are committed to the basic tenets of neoliberalism and maintain close ties to the resources sector. So 12, 13 years ago in his quarterly essay, uh, Guy Pearce documented this relationship in detail, observing that, quote, when carbon lobby recruits aren't moving through the revolving door between government and industry, they're often moving sideways between industry associations in a game of musical chairs. And in this context, Australia's particular version of extractive capitalism is less amenable to transitions, let alone just transitions, that are reliant on strong government leadership to enroll relevant stakeholders. But they're also a warning for elsewhere that transitions are, in Meadowcroft's words, irreducibly political, or in Weller's words, inherently redistributional and they're shaped by fundamental transformations in the ordinary routines of daily life, to borrow from Elizabeth Shadow and Gordon Walker. But to return to our findings, it may be that government's not willing to talk about transition, but lots of other people are. And before I go on, I'll just observe that this, uh, this screen grab of the ABC News uh, just last week or the week before, was a, a Labor's new resources minister wading into the debate about the uh, interruptions to energy supply on the East Coast and saying, really what we need is to get the coal plants back online. Apparently ignoring the fact that most of the coal plants were offline because of unplanned maintenance. They've broken down basically. So communities, unions, campaigners, industry, investors, and even some governments in Australia are now finding the ability to have conversations about transition, even if they still struggle with the terminology. One civil society interviewee said there's absolutely movement amongst regional stakeholders. It's been growing for the last three or four years, but it's really happening now. It's got to the point where the problem's been recognized and there's efforts to tip resources in and understand how to attack it. There's been a community shift that don't have data on it necessarily, but you can feel it. Environment movements, both young and old, have now maintained a steady chorus calling for transition for years. By old, you've got uh, organizations such as the Australian Conservation Foundation and by new movements such as uh, the School Strike for Climate. And the Australian union movement, after a rocky and fractious start, are beginning to lead conversations about the mechanics of transition. So just a few days ago, the Western Australian government announced that it would be off coal-fired power by 2030. Uh, and you know, in the accompanying media commentary, the CFMEU Mining and Energy Division's uh, State Secretary, Greg Busson, was there advocating for this transition. Those who know the internal mechanisms of the union movement know that there's been a huge amount of divisive um, argumentation between the mining and energy union and the other branches of the union movement. On top of these, what you might call traditional advocates of transition thinking, investors have become increasingly vocal in calling for explicit transition plans driven by what they call ESG, ecological, social, and governance uh, factors in their investment decision-making. And one union representative noted that there's been a recognition that rather than just disinvesting, investors feel they need to stay invested in fossil fuels in order to shift uh, the trajectory of, the, of those resources, along the lines of what Mike Cannon-Brooks is trying to do with AGR. Such is the momentum, in fact, that absent any government incentive in Australia, both of Australia's largest coal miners, BHP and Glencore, have started to mobilise transition in their lexicon. BHP prefers to talk about divesting from thermal coal and retaining metallurgical coal, whereas Glencore uses this terminology of responsibly depleting our coal portfolio over time, and in fact, is actually counting its scope-free extraterritorial emissions. In other words, there's no shortage of willingness to talk transition. What remains to be seen is the extent to which this commitment is genuine, 
and the way interventions of such stakeholders shape or constrain the opportunity space for transition. So Caleb Goods gives us reason to be cautious, arguing that Australian corporations and their work through industry associations seek to reframe the very idea of just transition in ways that emphasize the quote, corporate centered justice hierarchies, which maintain existing political economic systems. Uh, Curran likewise cautions that incumbent actors who dominate and benefit most from the status quo energy system are indeed the ones who are able to steer transition and are likely to prefer transitions which work in their interest, providing new sites of accumulation rather than broader transformations in the base of production and the relations of power. So you've got actors such as BP who are branding themselves in solar. Also the case in, in my other research with sort of these conglomerates in India, uh, such as Adani, which has got big interest in coal, but also big interest in renewables. So in this sense, while the primary apparent barrier to just transition, to return to the title of this slide, is the politicization of the language, we should be cautious in ascribing these political discourses with too much explanatory power, but should dig into the rationale underpinning them. Final policy focused findings from this project are about how to have productive conversations about just transition. Understanding the challenge, what can we do to start these productive conversations? And we found firstly that there's a need to listen. As one community representative reflected, many people have wanted to actually take action, but they haven't listened. So first they need to listen to the community. They need to hear the fears of communities. They, want, they need to actually understand what these communities need. They need to understand what people hope for. Then they can start imagining together, but being realistic in that imagination, of that imagining. And the interviewee went on, what we need to do first is to stop demonizing coal because you push people away. And if you push people away, they don't want to listen to you. In this sense, considerable damage has been done to the broader quest for a just transition by well-meaning outsiders going into regional communities and calling for a just transition, ironically, without explaining what it means and what pathways lead there. As one industry uh, representative put it, people flying in from Sydney, Brisbane, Melbourne to kind of lecture the regions, they're seen as outsiders. It's very easy for people to get their backs up because it's seen as lecturing rather than asking. An analogy I've been giving in different forums to explain this is that you don't get on a train at the behest of a stranger without asking that stranger why you need to get on a train, where you're going, why you shouldn't go by some other mode of transport, and how long it's going to take. And you certainly don't put your children on that train without asking those questions. The second thing to do to have productive conversations about just transition is to give substance to the term. Uh, and a, a union interviewee reflected, there's a view that just transition is just structural adjustment with a marketing label. And Cecil Roberts, the president of the American Mine Workers said, the reason I don't believe in just transition is because I've never seen it. This means on one hand, using the right messengers to talk about just transition. As a civil society uh, interviewee put it, because the narrative has been run by environmentalists, it's meant it's not taken seriously and it's just seen as a nice thing that you tack on. But it's not only important who the messenger is, but the message itself has to resonate. This means using the term just transition, I'd argue but using it concretely and specifically, explaining why change is needed, what changes are needed, where the key challenges lie, and how we hope to overcome them. 
has to be said that the academic literature is less helpful in guiding us in this endeavor because it contains very few strong or widely agreed examples of realized just transitions. The one that's always pointed to is the phase out of coal mining in Germany's rural region. Perhaps the closest thing to a successful case from which positive lessons can be learned. And there certainly are lessons to learn from that example. However, we must remember that that German context is specific and different to Australia. For instance, in Germany's more social democratic form of capitalism, governments, industry and the labor movement started the process by sitting down together and saying, we need a transition, how are we gonna get there? Obviously very different from the kind of combative approach we've had in Australia. Thirdly, discussions about just transition must focus not just on workers and wages, but on livelihoods and communities. This came through really strongly in our interviews. Yeah. How can a just transition, one community worker said, be just about the workers? Just about, you know, a hundred people in the community. Or another from a, a union perspective said, there's a whole lot of other workers in the region that will be affected who don't have the terms and conditions and redundancy payments that the power station workers have. So if you're a casual working in a shop in the Latrobe Valley and the power station closes and a whole lot of money goes out of the community and you lose your job, there's no redundancy. There's nothing for them. So they're actually very vulnerable. These reflections seek to reinforce or act to reinforce the notion that jobs and workers never exist independently of the communities they live in. So there's a need to leverage the skills and the expertise of regional communities to shift our society to more sustainable footings. And this conversation must involve all sectors of the community. Here there's more potential for academic research as it as currently stands to contribute to broadening the frame of reference and providing ideas to those implementing just transition policies. But most of the Australia focused literature still tends to focus on what to do with the redundant workers, the creation of new jobs, the quality of those jobs and the, the industries they're going to be in. Scholars working in different contexts, however, have argued for more radical work modes of direct worker union and local community engagement, participation and empowerment. This is both necessary as a component of procedural justice and to ensure that policies are appropriate as Morton, Snell and Wiseman have argued, but also to avoid local hostility and opposition to transition. A point made by Carrie Dahlgren actually in her work with um, pro-coal uh, lobbyists, really interesting anthropological work. A just transition thus hinges on what Sally Weller calls both local empowerment and self-determination and a new relationship with the state. And some commentators like Goddard and Farrelly have called for actually a return to active state-led industrial planning. Not sure if it's so much a return in Australia as a new form of state-led industrial planning in which workers, communities and unions are involved in the planning process. So of course, a so-called just transition, which focuses only on workers, will never really be just unless it also engages the broader community, both in, as an object of transition but also in the processes and decision-making leading to that transition. And as work from environmental justice scholarship has shown, there's no truly just participation or distribution without attention to other facets of justice, including recognition-based concerns, draw on Iris, Marion Young and Nancy Fraser and Axel Honneth's uh, more radical reframings of justice theory. It's noteworthy that this actually should be compatible with just transition as originally formulated by the union movement. The American union activist Tony Mazzocchi, described by his biographer, or the title of the book about him is The Man Who Hated Work and Loved Labour, 
advocated more than merely replacement of industrial jobs for displaced workers that he was concerned about, envisaging more expansive opportunities for them and their communities, such as dedicated study sabbaticals. Have any academical nurse, you need a sabbatical to get a break often. Right? Fourthly, uh, and finally, discussions about just transition have to be framed in terms of justice. Let's not pretend that the companies or the market can care about the workers in coal mines, the workers in the service economy, the regional communicate, uh, communities they're located in, or the indigenous lands they live and work on. And that's just in the Australian context where all of these are formalized. As Kuntala's work in India shows, there's a whole informal economy around coal extraction in other places as well. But in a context like Australia, I always say when a property developer goes bust, the people affected first and most are not the company directors, the shareholders or the clients, as inconvenient as it may be. They're the carpenters, plumbers, electricians and bricklayers who've given their labor, often bought materials and then are never paid for them. The same analogy applies to regional communities in Australia whose economies currently revolve around coal. They'll be the ones to suffer first, hardest and longest, but they can't muster the language and the will to plan for a transition away from coal. So this policy call is underpinned by a growing body of academic scholarship, which argues that just transition requires attention to both the winners and losers, and the fairness and equity questions associated with those negatively impacted by a transition, but also the deeper theories and practices of justice, justice that might be enabled or constrained by the way we approach just transition. This is a more radical agenda, which requires elevating the social alongside the technological aspects of the energy transition. But I think we can go even further here. There's an open question as to who and at what scale just transition thinking and planning should focus. As White notes in 2020, whether the just in just transitions should prioritize the struggles of displaced fossil fuel workers and communities, interstate, interregional or intersectional inequalities, intergenerational justice, or indeed give priority to colonized people against settler colonial states, or even the ecological debt between the North and the South is far from settled. So there's questions to ask for theoretically engaged work on just transition. Questions like who, if not just coal workers and their proximate communities should be included in a just transition. What insights can just transition scholarship yield for broader questions of international climate justice? How do transition outcomes and processes intersect with existing gender and race-based inequalities? And what about the enduring histories of colonization, dispossession, and indigenous sovereignty or lack thereof? In other words, is just transition, is a just transition, one that simply does not further entrench disadvantage? Or is it a means to addressing existing inequalities and injustices along these lines, class, gender, geography, race, etc.? These kinds of questions were beyond our remit in this short policy focused study but they're central to my ongoing research about how Australia's coal exports can be justified in the context of climate change. As I said earlier, the vast majority of Australia's coal is mined for international export and thus inherently connected to commodity markets, trade agreements, energy use by other nations and localized health impacts where the coal is burned. Though there's undoubtedly a need for locally led and place-based transition approaches within Australia, it therefore follows that any transition approach within Australia must account for the international implications arising from Australia's coal industry. 
but these international considerations are as yet inadequately explored, in my view, in both the Australian and international literature on just transitions. I'll just finish with a caution or questions. As Sipplet and Harrison put it in a recent paper in Environmental Politics, scholars have treated just transitions in an aspirational and uncritical way, ne neglecting to address the conflicts that do or could arise between sustainability and justice goals, or among justice goals themselves in planning and activism. This lack of critical attention to the tensions inherent in just transitions, efforts, parallels a pattern that others have observed in the broader field of environmental justice studies. The interactions between environmental justice as a body of theory and just transition is the task of quite another paper, but it points to a clear need to both intervene in policy for particular places and also remain critically aware of the implications of those interventions elsewhere. Clearly, we must collectively do better. The future of our planet and the society is built in it to deserve no less. Thank you.